Greetings to you again today. We're beginning on our 27th lesson. In this lesson, we're going to see how Jesus taught about the new birth. In Mark, the 12th chapter, verse 37, we see that the common people gladly heard the words of Jesus. In Luke, the fourth chapter, verse 18, we see that Jesus came and preached to the poor. Uh, according to 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26, we see that the learned people did not always receive Jesus. Many of the chief rulers believed on Jesus, but they would not confess their belief in him because they were afraid they would be thrown out of the synagogues. The praise of people was more important to them and the praise of God. You can read that in John, the 12th chapter, verses 42 through 43. In John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, we see that there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said unto Jesus, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. No man can do these miracles that you do except God is with him. Jesus answered Nicodemus and said this to him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus said in this that the only way that a person can see and enter the kingdom is to be born again. Nicodemus did not understand what Jesus meant by being born again. He could only relate to how that he was born naturally. So he asked Jesus, how can a man be born when he is old? Jesus answered him in John 3 and verse 5, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. See, the new birth, or being born again, includes two parts, the water and the Spirit. And that is a big S, speaking of the Spirit of God. Water refers to baptism in water and the Spirit to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which God gives to all that obey Him, according to Acts, the fifth chapter, verse 32. Jesus spoke clearly of this promise to all believers. Jesus had gone to Jerusalem for the Jewish feast of the tabernacles. And at that feast, he made a very dramatic and significant statement. We read about it in John, the seventh chapter, verses 38 and 39. We mentioned this previously, but I want to share it again. Here's, here is John, the seventh chapter, verses 38 and 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly, that word actually means heart, shall flow rivers of living water. Going on, it says, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. You find that in John 7, verses 38 and 39. So we observe closely what Jesus said. We see that the promise is to everyone. The only qualifying factor is that a person would be thirsty. That is speaking of a spiritual thirst. Uh, the person must come to Jesus. 
The person who would receive this promise must believe on Jesus. But if they believe on Jesus like the scripture says, this verse tells us that they should receive the Holy Ghost. It was to be given later at the Feast of the Tabernacles. At that time, Jesus spoke of it. But we will look ahead and see that in Acts, the second chapter, after Jesus ascended to heaven, previously he had told them when he was leaving to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. It was there on the day of Pentecost, which was the feast of Pentecost, that they did receive the Spirit. The rivers of living water that flow out of a believer is the Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost. In the early 1800s, there was a circuit rider named Peter Cartwright. A circuit rider was a preacher who traveled on horseback from church to church. He was Lincoln's opponent for election to Congress. One night, Peter Cartwright stayed overnight with a very skeptical physician who claimed that the only reality is what the senses can discern. So the, the physician asked the, the preacher, Peter Cartwright, did you ever see, hear, or smell, or taste religion? Peter Cartwright said no. The conversation went back and forth. Did you ever feel religion? Yes. Now then, said the doctor, feeling very triumphant. I have proved beyond the shadow of a doubt by four respectable witnesses that religion is not seen, heard, smelled, or tasted. And just one witness, feeling, testifies that it is an experimental fact. The evidence is overpowering, sir, and you must give it up. Peter Cartwright then said to the doctor, in pretending to relieve pain in the human system, you have been playing the part of a hypocrite and practicing fraud on people in pain. The physician suddenly acted indignant with Cartwright's statement. Cartwright then asked the physician, well, sir, did you ever see, hear, smell, or taste pain? The physician replied, no, sir. Did you ever feel pain? Certainly, I did, sir. I have felt pain, said the physician. Cartwright then said, well, four respectable witnesses have testified that there is no such thing as pain in a human body. In that moment, Peter Cartwright, the preacher, fell on his knees and began to pray. In a short time, the physician's heart was broken up as he began to repent and call on the name of Jesus. He shouted with a loud shout of triumph. Following this experience, the physician sent his own slaves back home to Liberia at his own expense, and the physician himself became a preacher. Isn't that an awesome story? It's true. Going on, we see that Jesus taught many things in parables. A parable is an earthly story with a spiritual application. It is used to tell a great truth through parables. Jesus used a known to reveal an unknown to his disciples, and he presented the spiritual meaning to everyone that would listen. The parable of the sower is found in Matthew, the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 9. The meaning of this parable is given in the same chapter, verses 18 through 23. 
parallel accounts of this parable are found also in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, 1 through 20, and in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 4 through 15. The basic lessons of this parable are the seed that is sown is the word of God. The wayside, the wayside soil represents those that hear the word of God, but they fail to understand it. And we see in the explanation that Jesus gave that the devil comes quickly to snatch away the word from those people that do not understand. The stony soil represents those that hear the word and receive it joyfully for the moment. But when trials come, they fall away because they are not grounded. Their roots have not gone down into the soil. And the word of God is how that people's roots grow. We must continue in the word of God and in prayer. The thorny ground represents those that hear the word and they begin to bear fruit, but they allow the cares and the pleasures of this life to grow strongly in their life. And those cares and pleasures of life eventually choke out their desire and love for the word of God. But the good ground in this parable represents those that hear the word of God. They continue in it. They understand it and they follow it. The parable of the pearl of great price is found in Matthew, the 13th chapter verses 45 and 46, it says this, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. We can learn important lessons from this parable. Everybody is searching for something to satisfy their soul. Salvation through Jesus is the most valuable thing we can find in this whole world. When we find Jesus, it is worth giving up anything to follow him. I'd like to share another story with you uh, that I have read. It is about General Bramwell Booth. He lived from 1856 to 1929. He was the son of General William Booth, who began the Salvation Army. <coughs> Excuse me. He once told the following story. I was once traveling by train with a man named Cecil Rhodes. Mr. Rhodes was a man that had gathered many valuable pearls, fame, honor, wealth, and power but he did not have the pearl of great price, which is Jesus. My father, William Booth, was in the next carriage. I was struck by the depression and gloom on Mr. Rhodes, but I was hopeful for him, and because of his interest in our work with the Salvation Army, I said to him, Mr. Rhodes, are you a happy man? He threw himself back in the seat, looked at me with an extraordinary stare, and exclaimed, Happy? Am I happy? Good God, no. And then, when I spoke to him, if the only rest for the human spirit be in Jesus, when I spoke to him of the only rest for him being in Jesus, he said to me, I would give all that I possess to believe what that old man in the next carriage believes. Remwell Booth said, I will never forget the complete tragedy of his voice as long as I live. Only when people find Jesus will their soul be at peace. 
because nothing can satisfy our soul but Jesus. It reminds me of that song that we used to sing, only Jesus can satisfy your soul and only he can change your heart and make you whole. He'll give you peace you never knew, sweet love and joy, someday heaven too, for only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Amen. God bless you, and I look forward to the next video.